Good. Perfect. Welcome, everyone, to the National Constitution Center. So great to see uh, so many old friends and new. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, which, and this is just a little secret that I'm going to share with you today, <laughs> is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the US Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. We have some great town halls coming up as uh, the Supreme Court prepares to decide some blockbuster cases. On June 2nd, we're having a debate with our friends in Intelligence Squared on marriage equality. Uh, on June 9th, uh, Kenji Yoshino will talk about his new book on the Perry case. Both of these will coincide with the opening of our new exhibit, Speaking Out for Equality, the Constitution, the Supreme Court, and Gay Rights. Uh, later this week, I think uh, tomorrow, in fact, we have the beginning of the Bill of Rights with Carol Birkin, the great historian. And then our town hall debates are going on the road. And the next one is June 16th in New York, where we'll have a debate with the American Constitution Society and the Federalist Society debating the constitutionality of NSA surveillance, which is a topic that I know will come up in our discussion today. Um, I'm so pleased to welcome two dear friends to the National Constitution Center. So those of you who've been here before know how many wonderful authors and thought leaders we have here. Uh, but Mark and Danielle, in addition to being the most uh, important and influential writers about privacy today, uh, are, are two friends who I've been in the trenches with for, for many years. Um, Mark is the head of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, which I think is the most important uh, NGO that defends privacy and civil liberties in the electronic age. I've had the privilege of serving on its advisory board. I think Epic is the only advisory board I'm on. And it's just a magnificent place based in Washington, DC, that Mark founded uh, uh, 20 years ago um, to keep alive the spirit of our mutual hero, Louis Brandeis, who we're going to talk a lot about uh, today, and to advocate for privacy in all sorts of forums, before Congress, before the Federal Trade Commission, by filing briefs, by bringing together intelligent argument. What Mark does is respect the intelligence of the American citizen, and he believes that by bringing together facts and legal arguments, he can really defend privacy at a time when it's never been more embattled. Uh, he's testified before Congress on more than 60 occasions. He's written more than 50 amicus briefs. He has received many awards, including the World Technology Award in law. He's often a guest in the media, but I just think he is the founding father of the most important privacy organization in our country. And Danielle Citron, uh, who is also uh, affiliated with Epic and likes it as much as I do, is the Lois K. Mock Research Professor and Professor of Law at the University of Maryland, Francis King Carey School of Law, she is really the most thoughtful writer on questions involving uh, the clash between notions of privacy and dignity on the one hand and free speech on the other. She's written the leading reports on hate speech on the internet, especially hate speech against women. Uh, she's got a great chapter in this book on revenge porn and the need to protect against it. And she so sensitively is able to articulate the harms, the dignitary harms of uh, hate speech and especially gendered-based hate speech and balance those against free expression norms. So we're going to have a great discussion. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark Rotenberg and Danielle Citron. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to start, Mark, uh, at the place both of you asking the question that you and I always ask together, WWBD, <laughs> what would Brandeis do? And I was so struck in reading your great introduction to this wonderful volume by how the spirit of Brandeis pervades so much of what Epic has done, uh, both its appearances before the Federal Trade Commission, which Brandeis helped to found, its reliance on amicus briefs, uh, which Brandeis pioneered in the Brandeis briefs uh, by emphasizing facts, its uh, faith in uh, legal argument. Tell us about how Brandeis inspired you and Epic. Um, well, first of all, Jeff, thank you to you and the National Constitution Center for, for the panel. Um, Brandeis, you know, in the privacy world is 
oftentimes been the focus of two um, very narrow opinions. I mean, one opinion, one law review article, which we all cite, uh, the famous Harvard Law Review article from 1890, the right to privacy, and the famous Olmstead dissent, the wiretap case. But of course, I spent a lot of time studying his life, as I know you have. And I was really um, fascinated by his interaction with key moments um, in American history. Uh, the First World War and the objections that pacifists raised that gave rise to the First Amendment uh, claims that the court eventually embraced. Uh, the rise of unions, new technologies, industrialization, uh, the progressive movement, uh, which of course was quite significant and in many ways something that I thought about in our current age because in Brandeis's era, people were experiencing rapid changes in technology that were clearly bringing social benefits, but they were also creating social disruption and new uh, challenges. And I thought about Brandeis's view, for example, of the role of the states in our federalist system. And he was fascinated by the ability of the states to innovate on the legislative front, such issues as um, limitations on the number of hours, for example, that people should have to work. Um, and the question became for him at a time that was deeply divided over the doctrinal issue of private contract, what we understand as, as the Lochner era, if a person is willing to work for 80 hours a week or if a 13-year-old you know, signs up for a job with an employer, we're supposed to respect that private arrangement. And I think Brandeis had the insight that when people are deeply divided as to their political views, one of the best ways to make progress is to bring evidence and information. And so at EPIC, uh, one of our key strategies has always been to try to find new evidence in support of a privacy argument so that we don't just end up saying, you know, privacy is important because we think privacy is important. Because typically on the other side, people are saying, well, you know, intelligence gathering is important because we think intelligence gathering is important. How do you move that discussion forward? And um, I think part of the answer is that you really have to do some digging. You have to ask questions about the effectiveness of intelligence programs. You have to understand, for example, in the context of the current debate over Section 215, has this actually provided any additional safety to the American people? Because if it hasn't, then we have a conclusion based not on people's opinion, but actually based on evidence. And I think one of Brandeis's many insights as we think about how to respond to new technologies is the need to evaluate, to assess, to try to learn more, and then draw the conclusions from what we've uncovered. Beautiful. Well, you and I have been having this discussion for years. I was pleased to tell you in the green room that my book on why Brandeis matters today will in fact be turned in on August 1st and it'll come out next June yeah. to coincide with the 100th anniversary of Brandeis's confirmation hearings. And well, it'll be all Brandeis all the time, of course, next June, and maybe you can come back for, for that. I, I suspect that we'll have a few Brandeis events related to that. D Danielle, one question on which Brandeis uh, was uh, more influential than anyone else was the balance between privacy and free speech. And uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, Neil Richards, has just written a very interesting new book called Intellectual Privacy, which argues essentially that Brandeis changed his mind about the balance, that initially in 1890 he had defended the right to sue the press to suppress truthful but embarrassing information about people. That was the right he called the right to be let alone. But he came to believe that in a democracy that free expression was more important than dignity and he thought court should get out of the business of deciding what was and was not in the public interest. And therefore, says Richards, came to believe that the initial privacy right he proposed actually clashed with the First Amendment. Uh, do you agree with that assessment, or do you think that Brandeis would have struck a different uh, balance? And tell us how that relates to the kind of revenge porn issues that you discuss yeah. in your book. In other words, what would Louis Brandeis have thought about revenge I like porn? That, That's my right? question to you. Um, so first, can I shout out to Epic, which I think you're most recent project on algorithmic transparency is very Brandeisian, right? The transparency of these big, the bigness 
a very powerful algorithm. So maybe that could make it into your book. I don't know the epic campaign. <laughs> okay, now I'll answer the question. I promise I'm not evading it. Um, so you know, Brandeis is is complicated. I think even in the right to privacy, we see a recognition that for matters of public importance and public figures, that this notion of the right to control one's information and the domestic sphere that he sort of poignantly writes about, that he, I think, reconciled, he saw the clash coming, right? Um, and that I, he, wasn't, he didn't shy from it. I don't, I, the notion that um, public, you know, speech on all matters trumps, I don't think Brandeis would agree. Even post Olmsted, right? I think Brandeis would say, no, there are certain sort of dom in the domestic sphere in which um, we can count on some s sacredness and confidentiality in ways in which we have to invent ourselves, right? By trying out our different selves and what we share. And it reminds me, Jeff, of your um, work about how intimacy develops is through that kind of confidentiality and privacy. And I think Brandeis would say of revenge, so let's move it to the non-consensual posting of nude photos, which is against someone's wishes, right? Um, I think Brandeis would be safe to say that it is because it's shared often within intimate relationships. And when someone posts that nude photos in betrayal of someone's confidence and trust, that that is a zone of a zone of sacrality and privacy that I think he would recognize, uh, and I think we can reconcile with the First Amendment doctrine that we have today. To tell the audience what the current state of the law about revenge porn is. Do some people claim that restrictions on it violate the First Amendment? Right. So, as it stands, there are 18 states that criminalize the non-consensual postings of posting of nude photos. Um, and some of, the, and then we have 22 states that are considering such legislation. There's also a federal criminal revenge porn legislation that's being considered, though it hasn't been made public yet. And I worked on a bill in Maryland. So the ACLU and I together drafted a bill uh, on behalf of Representative Cardin, and we were very narrow in how we understood it. It was would only apply to breaches of confidentiality um, or instances where there was an understanding of privacy, right? And it sort of came out of committee broken, I think. You know, so, so the ACLU testifies against, I don't testify for. Why? Because it's both too narrow, only applying to nude photos posted on the internet, um, and too, too broad, like without the mens rea that we thought was really crucial to reconcile it with the First Amendment. So it's true that of those 18 statutes, that state for state are on the books. Uh, Arizona, for example, its law just was challenged by the ACLU, and rightfully so. It was a terribly drafted statute, far too broad, right? It might even cover pictures of artwork, nude artwork, right? Uh, it was troubling, uh, and that statute is now being revised. So I think we have hard work to do at the legislative level, and we've got to get it right, because we're making a ton of progress in the work that I do on online harassment is getting people to understand and see that when you threaten someone online and you post their nude photos without their consent, along with often impersonations that suggest they're interested in sex and their home address, and defamatory lies about them. So for example, saying they're a prostitute, they're available for sex, or have a sexually transmitted disease. It's been a long haul for me over seven years to get people to understand that kind of harassment as incredibly harmful speech we can prescribe and I think post you know, the attacks on women in gaming, the release of Jennifer Lawrence's nude photo, remember last summer, right? We had the public sort of say, this isn't OK. Invasions of sexual privacy and hum sexually humiliating and sexually threatening speech is, is something we, it, we, we shouldn't have to live with, right? The victims shouldn't have to fend for on their own. And my worry is in passing laws that are too broad uh, that aren't constitutional, we're going to have a backlash, right, of companies that are, are certainly irritated and worried about losing their immunity, that people aren't going to buy into the fact that this is true and meaningfully often crimes, torts, and civil rights violations. Just one more question on this. I was surprised to learn that it wasn't illegal already. Could, could people sue under the Brandeis torts and just say it's highly offensive to a reasonable person to dispute Yes. This I mean, so I think we can clearly make the argument under public disclosure of private fact just as we saw for, remember, the Pamela Anderson Lee and Brett Michaels made it, two celebrities made a sex tape. It was just for their eyes only. It was not meant for anyone else. 
someone steals it, sells it to a porn company, Vivid is selling the tape, and they sought an injunction uh, and sued under the tort of public disclosure, and they got the injunction, and they, the tort was recognized, because as the court explained, even celebrities have a right to sexual privacy. That there's no public interest in the most intimate of intimate affairs of someone, um, even celebrities. And I think we might make exception for like Anthony Weiner. <laughs> Sorry. You know what I mean? His like Why? Twitter shots of his crotch that he said, so forgive me guys, a lot of my work requires me to say things that are somewhat unlovely, right? So <laughs> as, yeah, as my husband said of my book, building, is that okay guys? <laughs> my husband said of my book, it's the only book published by Harvard Press where there is a curse word literally on the first 10 pages of every page. Um, but uh, you know, I think, we can, so Anthony Weiner took pictures of his crotch, sent it to someone, she then shares it with the press, the press publishes those photos. And you know, if Anthony Weiner sued the press for publishing those photos, I would represent the defendant and argue that it's a matter of public interest. There's nothing, you know, that it's news, I'm sorry, represent the plaintiff, right? The news organization, forgive me, I just flipped that, right? And saying, look, we can publish this. The press can publish it. It's a matter of public interest. If you're assessing who the mayor should be of New York, and Anthony Weiner, remember he was running? I want to know as a voter, as a former New Yorker. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, this question of whether judges or Google should decide what's in the public interest, Mark, is at the center over uh, a new right that the European Union has proposed, which is mentioned in the book, called the right to be forgotten. Uh, you and I have disagreed a little bit about this uh, right and the proper balance between privacy and free speech. Uh, just to be provocative, let me suggest that the mature Brandeis would have <laughs> <laughs> repudiated the right to be forgotten because he would have thought that, that Google shouldn't be in the business of deciding which posts about me are or are not in the public interest and would have privileged free speech over privacy. I think you feel differently, so tell me why. Well, just to be accurate, I think Brandeis would have supported the European decision on the right to be forgotten. Um, in fact, as I, as I read the opinion, not only the outcome, but even the structure looked very familiar to me. It looked like the 1890 article. Um, because let's just understand, you know, what Jeff is talking about, and I think it's, you know, certainly the focus of a very important uh, legal discussion today about the relationship between privacy and free expression. Um, it concerns a, um, a Spanish um, a citizen who had uh, bankruptcy records published, uh, required, by the way, under a state law, uh, in a Spanish newspaper over 10 years ago. And um, he satisfies his bankruptcy um, obligations and then learns that there's an internet company called Google and that anyone who types in his name, the first thing they come up with is this article from 10 years ago saying that uh, he had been subject to bankruptcy, right? And um, he goes to the Spanish newspaper and he says, this is terrible for me. It injures my reputation, my ability to get business and so forth. And he goes to Google and says, you know, you need to take these links down. And the Spanish Data Protection Agency does something very interesting. It says to him, you know what? Um, the Spanish news organization is a news organization. And we're not going to tell them to remove this information from their website or their archives or anything else because we understand the value of press. However, they say to Google, well, you're a commercial search engine. You have a somewhat different role here, and you profit from taking information and making it available to others. And here's a person that seems to have a pretty strong privacy claim. And we think in some instances, not all instances, you should respect that claim. And Google appeals that judgment to the European uh, court. And the European court essentially affirms it, says, we think that's correct. Not in all instances, but in some instances, people should have the right to have the links removed by the commercial search engine. But the underlying information produced by the press organization should remain intact. So the remarkable uh, finding of the court on this issue is that actually free expression is quite important. And even though this person wanted the story removed from the news organization. The European court didn't say that, said, no, we're not going to do that. It did say to Google, however, that it had an obligation in some circumstances. Now, here's where it gets interesting. And this is why I think it looks very much like Brandeis. The European court said the competing interest here 
you know, we have the privacy interest on the one hand. The competing interest is not really Google's free speech interest. That would, that would misunderstand what's going on in this case. The competing interest is the public's right to know about the private life of this individual, which is almost exactly the very first thing that Brandeis said in his 1890 article, having announced the importance of the right to privacy. He said, but wait just a moment. We're going to have to look at the exceptions. What would those exceptions be? And Brandeis says more than a century ago, well, when the public has the right to know about a person's private life, then the privacy right would not apply. So let's go the next step and ask the question, what did Brandeis anticipate and how would that apply in the European case? Brandeis said, well, if you have a public figure, you know, someone who's running for office, you know, someone who says, for example, uh, family values are really important to me. You know, I believe that women should not have sex before they're married. I believe in marital fidelity and I believe you should, you know, vote for me for office because these things are important to you as well. And someone finds out that in the person's private life, in fact, they have very different views <laughs> from what I know this rarely happens. <laughs> but let's just imagine for a moment that it does. I think in that situation, the press has every right to report on the person's private life because he has held himself out in a certain way. He has made himself public and now he's subject to a higher level of scrutiny and that's exactly the exception that Brandeis anticipated. And here's my point about the case going back to Spain. If this individual decides to run for finance minister in the Spanish government, I think the fact of his personal bankruptcy becomes extremely relevant and his privacy claim goes away. But you see what the European court did in effect was to say we need the ability to evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis the strength of the privacy claim as against the strength of the public's right to no claim. And that's almost precisely what Brandeis had said more than a century ago. Uh, Danielle, do you agree that Mark is completely wrong? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, no. So the argument, on, the argument on the other side, he makes, he makes the argument in favor of the right to be forgotten and Brandeis very well. The argument against is something like this that it's not a court, it's basically young lawyers at Google who have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether if during this show someone is tweeting that I'm doing a boring job moderating this and I then sue and say this affronts my dignity if we were in Europe, then first some junior lawyer at Google would have to decide, am I a public figure? Have I put myself forward? Is this tweet a contribution to literary, scientific, or public discourse or not? And this is the kind of decision that the mature Brandeis came to believe that neither courts nor lawyers should be making because, as he Not, said... Neither of us have a strong opinion, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> well, Danielle, is, I, think she, I think I know which oh way she's going to go, but I'm going to try uh, in, a, in a doomed effort to <laughs> actually get one of you to agree. So, uh, in, in the Whitney case, Brandeis said the public interest is omnipresent, and he came to believe that... Uh, it wasn't possible that it was up to democratic citizens, not to judges or lawyers, to decide what the public was interested in. So, it, are, are you completely convinced by that argument? What do they say? Pressure is on, right? <laughs> uh, knowing what Jeff and Mark think about this, um, I so I'm going to split it in the middle, right? Okay. So, so on the one hand, I am troubled that we are saying to companies, companies, not adjudicators, right, not people versed in it, couldn't even, I mean, maybe the folks at Google are 28-year-olds in t-shirts, no, not lawyers, right, making these decisions. And the court's so ordering that, that they as private actors make that decision, calling balls and strikes as to what's pub of the matter of public interest, what's purely private matters. And it's a company. They don't have an expertise. They don't know the sort of longstanding development of case law and public disclosure of private fact, right? So I think I am troubled in that regard, who they're ordering to so do it. I'd rather see, I mean, I know ultimately it's appealable to a court, right, if the decision that the ISP makes, sorry, the search engine makes is doesn't sit well and that they can appeal it to a court. But I think the first sort of set of eyes should be an adjudicator, right, rather than a private company. But at the same time, private companies, they're not government actors. And so they can and do make important choices about norms on their sites, which I'm glad they're making, right? 
Um, and just to return to why Brandeis would say revenge porn is not of sort of public interest. I mean, I want to go back to the dissent in Olmsted and think about the crucial privacy right in our communications, right? And so often when we're sharing nude images with each other, it's, communi it's communicated via cell phone. So it's part of our sort of communicative intimacy. So I think, I, I wasn't sure if I fully answered it before. I think Brandeis might be on the side of Angel, so to speak, on that one. Um, but we do see in our system a kind of abridged right to be forgotten in the Fair Credit Reporting Act, right? That credit reports can't include bankruptcies after, I think it's 10 years, right? And lean, so Mark, you can help me with this, like FICRA, both of you, right? So we do, in some sense, have a notion of you get a free pass at a certain point, absolution, right? Even in our own law. Um, that I think we can recognize a very narrow understanding of the right to be forgotten in the states. Excellent. Well, we have done. So I definitely didn't make you happy, but I no, try, no, you that's know. good. You, you've <laughs> heard all three arguments, and you can make up your own minds as always. Let's cha I th let's channel Brandeis on the many fascinating issues in this book. This is a collection of essays by scholars affiliated with the Electronic Privacy Information S S Center on all the most important privacy issues, public and private, facing the world today. So it's really a useful primer, and I learned a lot from it. Uh, Mark, there are several writers about NSA surveillance and the very different approach that Europe and America are taking about Europe's distress with the fact that America distinguishes between citizens and non-citizens in its spying, uh, who predict that we'll come to regret that decision. Tell us, uh, first of all, what's going to happen in Congress, because this is being debated uh, as we speak, and then what would Brandeis have made of mass metadata collection? Wow. Um, well, what will happen in Congress? Well, this is a very interesting moment, and I have to be careful, of course, because it's being recorded. Uh, <laughs> no, no, it's all right. No one actually watches our videos. <laughs> um, but for those who are, we matter. listen to the podcast. The podcasts though. are very much. But for those who are looking back at this uh, panel discussion that took place at the National Constitution <laughs> Center in a week or two, the right? Future, yeah. yes. <laughs> a few days before the United States Senate uh, scheduled to meet to consider whether to continue the uh, bulk data collection program, uh, I'm going to go all in and say that I anticipate the Senate uh, will effectively end. Uh, the NSA program this Sunday by passing uh, some version of the USA Freedom Act uh, that was originally sponsored by Senator Leahy and Senator Lee. Worth noting, by the way, um, as Jeff often does, one of the wonderful things about the privacy issue um, is that it seems almost by design to be nonpartisan. And we typically find in many of our privacy efforts. Uh, you have the left and the right and the Democrats and Republicans and everybody sort of coming together and saying, in effect, this is one thing uh, we can agree on. And I think that's what's going to happen on Sunday um, in the Senate. Uh, it could be proven wrong. But it would be uh, historic, to be sure, and of particular significance for EPIC, because it was almost two years ago that we filed a petition with the U.S. Supreme Court in which we argued uh, that the NSA had exceeded its legal authority in demanding that the U.S. telephone companies turn over the telephone records of all their uh, customers. We didn't make the big constitutional argument, which others have made, um, and I think that's most likely the space that you know, Brandeis would explore, but we said rather more modestly that the language in the Patriot Act concerning relevance to investigations can't possibly encompass everybody's uh, telephone activity, which is how the NSA had interpreted um, its authority. Uh, we have a recent opinion from the Second Circuit that essentially supports the outcome we had sought, and I think on Sunday the Senate uh, will agree. Can I just pause on that yes. one, the, the, what the Senate will do question? So we've recently had two uh, exciting visits. Uh, Senator Lee, the sponsor of the Freedom Act, along with Senator Leahy, came to the Constitution Center a few weeks ago and loved it so much, he said, this is like constitutional Disneyland. Do I ever have to leave? <laughs> uh, and then just last week, Senator Ron Paul came. Ron Ran pa Ran Paul came and was similarly uh, enchanted with Signers Hall and took a selfie with James Madison um, and was a wonderful. Both, of, both Senator Lee and Senator Paul are wonderful friends of Epic and defenders of privacy. But on this, on this question, they actually disagree. Senator Lee thinks that the Freedom Act, which requires a 
warrant or some individualized suspicion yes. before data can be taken from the phone companies is the right balance between privacy and security. Senator Paul thinks that this is giving away far too much and that by authorizing even the phone companies to have the data and the government to get it by warrant, um, the uh, government is allowing the kind of searches that the framers repudiated in the writs of assistance. Did Epic have an internal debate about whether the Freedom Act gave too much away? And tell us about that. Well, discussion. we would always seek more. I mean, I, I think the Freedom Act was a well thought out compromise that was intended to limit uh, NSA bulk, actually end NSA bulk collection. So let's underscore that. Improve transparency for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, create a little bit more of an adversarial system for these decisions. Um, and ultimately provide better accountability for a very expansive surveillance authority created after 9-11. So all that's good. Um, but, you know, Senator Paul, I think, quite principally said, listen, uh, there are provisions in the Patriot Act that should simply be allowed to expire. And we don't need to have, you know, diluted versions of them. We simply want them to end. So when he took to the floor of the Senate recently to make the argument it wasn't an argument against the Freedom Act, but it was really an argument in favor of ending the uh, provisions of the Patriot Act that he and many others think uh, should expire. So I wouldn't argue against his uh, position. I testified um, somewhat presciently, I would say, in 2012, pre-Snowden, about um, the renewal of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And I said at that time, I said in the absence of accountability, in the absence of public reporting, you should be aware that at some point there's going to be revelations that are made and the true scope of these surveillance activities will then become known. It would be better to have a system where the public and Congress actually knows what's going on. And then, of course, the following year, uh, Mr. Snowden began releasing uh, many documents describing the program. The first release we thought was by far the most significant because it was the first release, which was the order from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to Verizon saying um, you need to release, you know, provide all the telephone records of all your customers. And I've been studying this law, this area of law and teaching this area of law for almost 25 years. I, almost, I couldn't believe it. You know, I read this, I thought it was like something out of the onion or something attached to a privacy law exam, you know, titled Draft an Unlawful Court Order. And I'm like, oh, this is a really good example. <laughs> and I have got my red pen out there. Did you use there. that for your exam question? I did actually. It's, <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like relevance to an ongoing investigation. Right. Well, well, that's easy. I mean, <laughs> you can't have all telephone records be relevant to an ongoing investigation. But of course, the order was, was truthful. It was accurate. And that was the basis for our petition to the court. Uh, Danielle, do you want to take the constitutional question? I was struck in, because I'm in the middle of the Olmstead chapter. Olmstead was yeah. the uh, 1928 decision where the court upholds wiretapping. Chief Justice Taft says, no trespass, no Fourth Amendment violation. And here they just put the taps on the sidewalks leading up to the bootlegger's office rather than breaking into the office. Brandeis writes an amazing dissenting opinion. He wants to include a reference to television, but he sees it as a two-way technology. He basically anticipates Skype. So his law clerk persuades him to take that out. But then he has this amazing passage where he looks forward to the age of cyberspace and says, ways may someday be developed by which it's possible without physically intruding into secret drawers to extract papers and introduce them in court. At the time of the general warrants and writs of assistance, a far smaller indignity was considered unconstitutional. We have to translate the Constitution so it protects privacy in the age of the wires. It's an amazing passage. Yeah. But what Brandeis thought is you couldn't do it even with a warrant. That right. basically, even if you had a warrant, you couldn't get the 75 pages of uh, telephone conversations because that invaded the privacy of people on both ends of the wire and was like the general warrants and writs of assistance which authorized the king to break into lots of innocent people's houses and riffle through their papers in a search for needles and haystacks. So forgive, again, I don't have any views on this question at all. I'm just, <laughs> tossing, <laughs> just tossing it out to you. But my, my, my understanding yeah. is that Brandeis would have thought that even the Freedom Act might be impermissible to the degree that it authorizes mass searches with a warrant. Mm -hmm. what's, your, what's your take on no, that? No, I think that's right. I think yeah. the notion of indiscriminate and continuous pervasive surveillance of our communications would violate that core intellectual privacy and ability to sort of, to, in order to be a citizen off stage and in public, mm 
we have to be able to be sort of free thinking on our own. And that's, I think that kind of surveillance, that continuous and indiscriminate surveillance, um, would, was exactly what he was talking about in his Olmstead dissent. Yeah. And so it's tantamount to living in a surveillance state, which is precisely what we wanted to avoid with the general warrants and writs of assistance. That puts it really well. The emphasis on freedom of thought is what he would have tried to uh, protect. And to the degree that ubiquitous surveillance threatens that, he would have had no trouble objecting to that uh, with or without uh, physical trespass. So Mark, how can you support the Freedom Act, which Brandeis might have thought uh, was unconstitutional? Yeah, I, I, I don't actually think I said I supported the Freedom Act. but. Um, now, I think your point, Jeff, is actually very, very important here because, you know, oftentimes we read Olmstead and we think, oh, well, you know, Brandeis argued for a warrant and Chief Justice Taft said a warrant was unnecessary. Congress could do this by statute if they wanted. And, you know, then we talk about Katz, which is the case that comes 40 years later and the Supreme Court says, okay, you do need a warrant. And we say Brandeis was vindicated. But I oftentimes, when I talk about these cases, I said that's not right at all, actually because the Brandeis dissent in Olmstead, as you pointed out, went much, much further. Brandeis wasn't about, you know, yeah, you can have all that information as long as there's judicial review. Brandeis had a view, as did many at the time, by the way, that the Fourth and the Fifth Amendment, in his words, ran together, and that they actually prohibited the collection of this kind of personal information. And so, of course, we were both thrilled when the Chief Justice published the opinion in the Riley cell phone search case. This was a very important decision from the US Supreme Court. Chief Justice Roberts, in his opinion, didn't explicitly mention Justice Brandeis, but he did something even better. He mentioned the Boyd case from the 19th century, which was the case that Brandeis had relied on in his Olmstead dissent to make this very powerful argument to limit the, go the scope of government searches. And it was, in effect, a shout out across the years to Justice Brandeis about the underlying importance of limiting government surveillance. The Boyd case is a favorite of both of ours. Justice Brandeis called it in Olmstead a case that will live as long as civil liberty is uh, remembered. And I just learned from Akhil Amar, who was here for a great talk uh, last week, that Boyd, uh, was a case that cited the scholarship of Justice Horace Gray on the writs of assistance, and Brandeis had clerked for, for Gray. So he was very attuned to this sort of Bostonian tradition, the Boyd Court, on which Gray now sits, having moved from the Massachusetts Supreme Court up to the U.S. Supreme Court, cites the story that Chief Justice Roberts told in the cell phone case of how when James Otis in 1763 denounced the writs of assistance, John Adams said, at that moment, the child independence was born. And it was Gray who had actually yes. told that story, and it goes up through Brandeis, so it's very exciting indeed. We've got some phenomenal audience questions, as always. Let me, before I turn to them, ask you about the Madrid Declaration at the end of this book. What are the main principles in it, and why do you support them? Great, well, thank you. The book is a collection, as, as Jeff described, as articles from uh, legal scholars and technology experts. It tells a bit of a history of EPIC. Um, but we wanted something at the end of the book to pull together the major themes. And of course, since the theme of the book is the search for solutions, uh, privacy in the modern age, uh, we looked to this uh, declaration that had been drafted several years ago by, by privacy uh, experts and advocates. And I think the remarkable um, fact of, the, of this statement is that it feels very familiar in some ways. It talks about the basic legal instruments that uh, protect the right to privacy. It talks about some of the new challenges, and then it proposes uh, very concrete solutions. Uh, everything from DNA data collection to mass surveillance to um, you know tracking and RFID. All these issues that we're struggling with today. So I think this um, declaration at the end of the book is actually going to hold up pretty well. I don't know if it's going to raise quite to the level of Olmstead dissent stature. But uh, we're going to hold it out there for a bit. I just wanted to understand, uh, should I be concerned about it as a right to be forgotten skeptic? Does it <laughs> emphasize any new dignity, well, dignitary uh, rights? Re or? Regrettably, we didn't put in an affirmation of the right to be forgotten. If, if we had saw that coming, I think we, we would have. But it's not to be found. We, we forgot it, I guess. <laughs> no pun intended at all. But just so, I, just so I understand the main takeaway, what, what, what is the global framework of fair information practices that it's, it's calling on? In other words, how would this change the current? Well, regime? many people in the privacy world talk about 
the protection of privacy in the modern age as essentially the enforcement of fair information practices. And what we mean by that catchphrase is that when you collect and use personal data, there are certain rights and responsibilities. And the rights essentially go to the data subject and the responsibilities go to the data collector. And if you think about it for a moment, this is actually quite intuitive. I mean, if you give your personal information to a bank or a credit card company, there's very little that you can do to protect that information once it's in the possession of someone else. And so what most of modern privacy law does is basically say if you're in the possession of personal information, you're now the ones with the responsibilities to you know, protect it against misuse, make sure it's accurate, used fairly, and so forth. And if you've given up personal information, you're basically the one who takes on the rights. You get to ensure that it's properly used and, and maybe be compensated if it's misused. And that's essentially what I think modern privacy law is those rights and responsibilities in the collection and use of data. Danielle mentioned the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It's a very familiar law. I mean, lots of people have the experience of being turned down for a loan, and they wonder, why did that happen? Why didn't I, you know, I thought I was paying my bills on time. And they have a right in law to see their credit report, and they have a right to see that incorrect information was there, that they were confused with someone else, that ultimately the determination was not fair. And just to put in one more word, something else we did not have in the Madrid Declaration, but I do see as the next evolution, the next step in the development of the right to privacy, is this notion of algorithmic transparency. Because increasingly, I think we're going to confront a world where decisions are made about us, that they're automated. The basis of the decision is largely opaque. We don't know which factors were considered, but there's an outcome. And somehow we're supposed to live with the outcome, whether it's you know, the, the evaluation of, of our children in this data intensive testing world of, of modern education or credit scoring or who gets pulled out of a line on an, at an airplane terminal. All of these processes are being automated. And I think one of the big challenges, even big companies like Google, um, who we've battled in the past over privacy issues, I'm actually concerned these days that they may be losing control over the processes that they've established. And that, I think, will actually put us on the same side as, as they are, at least with regard to how their machines are making decisions about all of us. Fascinating. OK, we've got some really great questions. And the first one is for Danielle. Should threats of rape and sexual assault on social media and in gaming be treated with the same seriousness as other terroristic threats, such as gun violence or homicide? Absolutely, right? So if a threat, um, and what we mean by terroristic threat is a threat that makes someone feel that they're in, uh, in danger, right? It has them change their lives. Uh, think of Brianna Wu, she's a game developer. Um, so when she was threatened on Twitter and then via you know, tweets just sent directly to her an email that said, I know exactly where you live and provided her address and were very direct graphic, leaving nothing to the imagination threats, she moved, she and her husband, Frank, moved from house to house, right? It fundamentally, a threat, can fundamentally change how you live your life, and that's why it's unprotected, right? At least, as the Supreme Court explains, it's liberty denying, right? So whether it is on Xbox Live, or it is in Call of Duty, if it's a threat that makes you uh, really believe that you're, you're going to face true physical trauma, then we ought to view it as the same. Great. Uh, the NSA is already on the internet backbone where it can easily intercept all internet activity. If they're prohibited from bulk data collection, does that mean they'll have to dismantle this ability, Mark? Well, the bulk data collection program is today directed toward the U.S. telephone companies with regard to domestic uh, communications. It's directed toward the telephone companies and the internet firms with regard to international communications. That second issue is not directly addressed by Congress, and I think it needs to be at some point. Um, so this is about stored data and what they're able to obtain from the companies through some legal process. The question, I guess, is more about the online interception, which, of course, concerns many of us. It was also part of the Snowden disclosure. Um, it's the reason, by the way, why many of the technology privacy people have remained so very much focused on the importance of encryption. Uh, which for Epic is actually part of our founding story. I mean, we got started 20 years ago 
because we believe that encryption was critical for privacy and security on the internet and the government was trying to limit its availability. Um, that issue, of course, has now returned as we've learned that the NSA has done a number of things to weaken encryption. And um, our view of this, again, coming back to Brandeis, is it's not so much whether you're for privacy or you're for national security. I think you have to take a step back and ask empirical questions. What are the consequences of weakened encryption? It may give the intelligence community access to communications of our adversaries, but it also means that our own communications are vulnerable to interception by others. And so we think that needs to be uh, factored into the policy equation. Great. Uh, Danielle, here are two great related questions. Uh, how does the law treat anonymity? When should it be protected and when is it dangerous, worthy of limitation? And then someone asked, please comment on privacy as it relates to Facebook, which of course does not allow anonymous postings. Okay, so um, we are, we're committed to anonymous speech, right? Think of the Federalist Papers written by Publius, right? Um, anonymity is crucial, as the court explains, for political and religious and other kinds of expression. Um, and I think that's true, that we ought to be committed to anonymity because anonymity also serves the domestic violence victim, the dissenter, the kid who wants to come out but is too afraid, right, online. And so anonymity, is, is incredibly important. And so I've long objected to the notion that real name policies on platforms that of course they can so choose as Facebook does, right, to require real identities. And I think that's a mistake. I think we should have a, a presumption in favor of anonymity that can of course be lost, a privilege that can be lost. If we abuse our anonymity, right, I think platforms are surely, of course they're within their right anyway, but to say, look, it's a privilege you lost. You're threatening someone, harassing them. Um, you are you know, invading their privacy and trying to do everything you can to get away with it, right? So that you have really destructive efforts and then anonymity shields them from accountability, right? And I think that's where we lose our privilege. But uh, anonymity is extraordinarily important for all of us, um, you know, victim and, and perpetrator alike. Great. Anything more on, on Facebook well, and privacy? Actually, the, the yeah. um, example that Danielle provides is, um, again, a bit of our history. We were involved in the um, rollout, I, I guess you say, of caller ID back in the 1980s. And uh, I had done work in the Senate on privacy issues, and I was approached early on to work on those cases. And you recall maybe that um, part of what caller ID was about was disclosing the identity of the calling party to the called party. And people said, well, that's kind of a neat feature, and if you're calling somebody, maybe your identity should be known. But there were all sorts of circumstances in which people did not want their identities known. And one of the examples that came up early on were women calling from domestic violence shelters, and they were trying to reach their children at home, and they didn't want their identity to be known, you, you know, to, to a spouse um, in that situation. And, you know, we began arguing uh, for the right to privacy, actually the right to anonymity in those kinds of circumstances that the telephone company should not be compelling the disclosure of, of actual identification. I remember also as in Philadelphia here in, in the um, state Supreme Court where the argument occurred, or maybe it was the federal court, but anyway, the, uh, it was, hmm somewhere close by. <laughs> one, of the, one of the very important early um, uh, privacy cases uh, was here in caller ID. And part of it turned on this type of concern. Wonderful. Um, how does privacy look worldwide? How does the US compare on various issues, surveillance, et cetera? A bunch of really thoughtful essays on that question. Do you want to give us yeah. a sense of some of the highlights? Well, it's a, it's a tremendous issue worldwide. I mean, there's just nothing else uh, to say uh, because, of course, all around the world, uh, uh, people have access to the internet. They experience Google and Facebook. They worry about NSA surveillance. Uh, they're increasingly exposed to new forms of identification and tracking uh, by their own governments. And it's led to uh, extraordinary uh, public debate and discussion. The United Nations, in fact, has recently announced a uh, plan to create a, a special rapporteur on the right to privacy in the modern age trying to build on uh, some of the traditional international human rights law. Um, you know, people say, is the U.S. better or worse than Europe? How does, you know, 
US and Europe compared to other parts of the world? I think it's a hard question to answer. I will say that if you look at some of the survey data from the Pew Research Institute, which is increasingly looking at privacy on a global dimension, you'll find surprisingly high levels of convergence uh, among people all around the world on privacy. And that's fascinating to me because, of course, a lot of times people say, well, we all have different attitudes about privacy. Um, but if you look at the polling data and you look at the responses, you'll find that people in East Asia and India and South America, U.S., uh, Europe share surprisingly similar views. Do you agree about the convergence, Danielle? There, there are obviously some difference, which we've been talking about. Europe's, European focuses on dignity and the U.S. on liberty. The French were criticizing us over NSA surveillance, but then they authorized some draconian surveillance right. of their own. What, what's your sense of the comparative I mean, situation? I think we, we kind of dismiss our system, our sort of privacy federalism, and there's, I think, much to it where you have state AGs, um, chasing sort of smaller companies and the FTC is a much more rigorous privacy enforcer and sectoral laws. I think we often dismiss our sort of our system of federalism and privacy and I don't think we should. Um, I'm not entirely convinced that Europe has a better system. Um, I think we ought to be sort of proud of what we have and enhance efforts to protect privacy, especially with state AGs working at, on these issues. At least that's my new topic. Right, I work with Attorney General Kamala Harris of California. Um, and California has been sort of the leader in privacy, and I want, want to see that state and others do more. That's a wonderfully Brandeisian answer, as, as Mark said. Love Brandeis it. talked about the states as laboratories of democracy, and That's you right. would have loved your. So I'm on a Brandeis state. project for my sabbatical this year. Um, but one other interesting thing that I, I we can't answer, but is really interesting. Jennifer Daskal has a new paper on how data kind of lacks territoriality. Right? So all of this, all of our data communications are flying everywhere. And in fact, a, a conversation that we have, New York, Philly, may indeed be sort of, um, that data is in India, right? And so it's some of our protections, I guess she is concerned about, these Fourth Amendment protections may not apply given the argument, ah, the data is located somewhere else, even though it involves sort of US citizens. So it's just an interesting question about so much of our Fourth Amendment both its protections and then can we enforce warrants outside the United States are contingent upon place that a lot of these technologies un unend or upend. It's fascinating, but what would So I don't know if that's right, but it's an interesting no. question that your question brought to mind. And my question back is, uh, what would Brandeis have made about international data flows? This is the great philosopher who opposed the curse of bigness in government and in economics and believed only in small scale communities could people achieve self-governance. His model was uh, Jeffersonian farms or fifth century Athens. What would he have made it in a world that is globalized and where data flows are international? I think he'd agree with Mark on algorithmic transparency and sort of sunlight as the ultimate disinfectant. Nice. Sorry, I had to do it. Good, right? beautiful. Right. Our hero, <laughs> who's just so prescient on all these issues, did say sunlight is the best disinfectant. I swear he didn't tell me to say that. No, no, which right. we're just, we're just riffing on, 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 on our hero. I'm just going to come back you know, to an earlier comment. I mean, I think part of Brandeis's understanding of our modern age was not to fight against it. I mean, he wasn't someone who would have said, you know, shut down the computers, they're going to lead to the end of privacy. I think he was someone who said, you know, these innovations are extraordinary and they'll lead to social advances, but there will also be social consequences and the modern democratic state gives us the ability through our policy making process to minimize those risks. I think he would have, in a sense, you know, welcomed the challenge of trying to understand how best to use the courts and the state legislatures to craft safeguards to protect the rights of people. Because it was ultimately the rights of people that he was most concerned about. And he could see you, you know, the impact on families of these you know, unfair working conditions and the need for states to be able to come up with legislative responses and also the need for people to be able to speak freely about these business practices, all in the context of something which I believe he cherished dearly, which was the modern democratic state. So I don't think that 
new technologies or globalization or any of these other factors would have discouraged him. I think it would have been simply a new uh, area to explore uh, democratic principles. Well, what an optimistic and Brandeisian note and that idea that citizens can, working through state legislatures and courts, protect basic rights and liberties is exactly what EPIC has done so well over the past 20 years. Brandeis would be proud. Please join me in thanking Mark Rotenberg and Danielle Sitcom. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Wonderful.